So this book was very hard for me to rate, mostly because throughout reading it, I was like, what the fuck is going on? All right, I'm back. So last time we left off, I rated all of the Asian books I've read three stars, which leaves us to one question. Am I a racist? Well, there is still hope yet because the next book that I read is Girls of Paper and Fire, which I rated four stars. This is an Asian-inspired YA fantasy book about a girl who lives in a poor village who gets chosen to be one of the king's escorts because every year he picks eight hot girls to bed him. This time he picks a ninth girl because she happens to have golden eyes, which is seen as like a very exotic special quality because this is a fantasy world where a mixture of human humans and demons and half humans and half demons all live together. It kind of gives a lot of Studio Ghibli vibes. The fact that she is a human girl who has golden eyes is a very special trait and so she gets chosen to become one of the king's escorts, which is really just a word for being a hoe. Um, and it's not a good thing to be a hoe. Nobody here wants to be a hoe because the king is like an abusive ass. That's pretty much it. The plot thickens though when she falls into a forbidden romance with someone. The forbidden romance that she falls into is actually with another woman. So once I found that out, that fucking changed everything, okay? That changed the whole fucking game. And I think this is really what pushed me to rate it four stars. I usually don't rate books like an extra rating just for diversity's sake, but I do feel like for what the author was trying to achieve and the thematic elements that she was trying to convey, it was executed well, even despite some of the flaws. Because the thing is, I don't think that this is like an amazing book. There are a couple of glaring flaws with it. Like for example, there is insta-love with the main character and her love interest that I wish could have been developed better. The main character herself is pretty generic and she kind of makes stupid decisions. So. I just didn't really see what was so special about her and she fell into a very generic, classic YA main character. That being said, I feel like there are other components of the story that made it special enough for me to bump it up above three stars. The first is that I really enjoyed how the setting for this book is kind of a blend of Chinese and Malaysian culture, and this was inspired by the author's biracial identity as well. And I think having that gave it more of an edge compared to traditional European fantasy settings. And the other reason why I appreciated what the book set out to do was that it essentially subverted the traditional narrative of the poor girl marrying an abusive king and finding out that he's not so bad after all. We've seen this so many times. Like we've seen this in Beauty and the Beast retellings and we've seen it in pretty much any fantasy YA book that you can think of. And I'm just sick of that shit. And what I appreciated about this was that the book clearly showed that this king is the villain. He is clearly abusive. He is clearly problematic. And this story is more so about the main character finding her own agency and her own empowerment to stand up against someone like him. There's no blurry line between whether he should be the love interest or whether he should be the bad guy. It's not like the Darkling from the Grisha trilogy. He is clearly shown as a bad guy. You don't want to root for him and instead you want to root for her with the other female love interest. I decided to rate it four stars because I do think that it provided a unique element and it provided a necessary subversion that we've been waiting for a long time. Within the context of what other YA fantasy books have traditionally shown, the author set out to write a book about sexual assault and rising above that and finding your own empowerment and agency. And I think she pulled that off quite well throughout the story. It was very clear what the message was and it was very purposeful. It's also worth noting that minority groups tend to face a disproportionate amount of sexual assault assault as well. So the fact that this is specifically an Asian inspired fantasy adds a whole nother layer to the themes that she set out to evoke. A lot of people had mixed feelings about the book or were disappointed by the book and I'm not quite sure why. I would guess it might be because they had high expectations for it. I expected the book to be three stars and I was just pleasantly surprised that it was anything slightly better than that. However, I consulted Jesse from Bowties and Books who is a fan of this book. They they said that there were basically a few common reasons for why people 
found the book to be not that great. The first was the insta love, which I agree with. The second was that they felt like the main character whined too much about being a hoe. I'm not even gonna touch upon that. And then the other reason was that they felt like the main character was slut shaming another character who ended up falling in love with the king. I wanna take this moment to say that the main character was not slut shaming that other girl, okay? She was dumb bitch shaming her because that girl was a dumb bitch. There is a difference between the two. To me, she was just like Tristan from The Gilded Wolves. The moment I read about her on her first page, I knew she was the weakest fucking link in the group. But anyway, the whole point of her falling in love with the king is is to show how abuse can be, I don't know, romanticized. That other girl could have easily been the main character of this story because her whole character arc was very similar to what we've already seen in other YA fantasy books. But thank God she wasn't. Thank God we just saw another girl's perspective instead who had more common sense than to fall in love with some asshole king. He's like a whole demon king too, so he's basically a furry. The point is, I don't think the book is problematic. I definitely think that it does have flaws, but not enough for me to hate the book or discredit it. And I think that it's worth having more books like these, more Asian books and more LGBT books and all of the above. So the more books that get published with these, the more we'll have better better developed romances and better developed narratives. But for now, I think that this is a good start. The next book that I read is I'm Afraid of Men by Vivek Shreya. This is a very short nonfiction book that is written by a trans artist who is essentially exploring how masculinity was imposed on her and then continues to haunt her into adulthood even after she transitions. I really liked this book. I gave it four stars and I came in with low expectations because I thought it was gonna be like we should all be feminists which I read earlier this year and I gave three stars because I wasn't impressed by that and the reason why I wasn't impressed was because I felt like I didn't learn anything new from that book it felt like very surface level feminism 101 and it didn't cover any intersectionality despite the author being black however what I really loved about this book was that not only did it cover gender it covered so many intersectional parts of it like the trans perspective and the Asian perspective and just so many different facets of her identity were incorporated to all of the questions that she asked and the experiences that she wrote about. I was left thinking new things that I hadn't thought of before. Um, granted, I am cis scum, so I do think that definitely has a part of how I learned new things from it. Here's one quote that I thought was very insightful from the perspective of cis straight scum. She leads a class of students to basically learn how to be less transphobic because a lot of people come from a place of ignorance where they think that it makes sense to ban trans people from bathrooms. She ends up telling them stories about trans people who have gone and killed or harassed. After she tells them those stories, they start to understand a lot more and they are a lot more sympathetic. And with all that in mind, she wrote this quote. I have always been disturbed by this transition, by the reality that often the only way to capture someone's attention and to encourage them to recognize their own internal biases and to work to alter them is to confront them with sensational stories of suffering. Why is my humanity only seen or cared about when I share the ways in which I have been victimized and violated? And then the last thing that I want to mention that I really enjoyed about this book is there was this whole part about her dating a guy who seemed so amazing and so sweet and kind because he was super understanding of her experiences and super patient throughout her transition. And ultimately, he revealed that he ended up cheating on her. She talked about how she felt embarrassed to admit that he cheated on her to her other friends because she didn't want to reveal that he wasn't one of the good guys like they had hoped. And despite his infidelity, she also reflects and talks about all of the hardships that he had to go through throughout the relationship. I really liked this quote. I think this was the most insightful thing to me and how I tend to view men. A common theme in my encounters and relationships is my certainty that the men I have admired were good. A synonym for different from the rest. This attachment to the promise of goodness is what left me bereft when, in various ways, I discovered that each of these men wasn't one of the good guys. 
How might my relationships with these men have been different if I had not expected them to be good or better than the other males I had encountered? I regret all of the times in our relationship that I told him he was a good man. I regret this not because he isn't a good man, but because good is a nebulous standard and our desire for something that can't really be measured outside of religious teachings and morality only sets us up for disappointment and sets up every gender for failure. The good man is a fiction. Instead of yearning for a good man, what if we made our expectations for men more tangible? What if, for example, we valued a man who communicates? Ultimately, what hurt me most about his infidelity wasn't the act itself. It was that it took him a month to tell me about it. The reason why I rated this four stars instead of five stars is because the whole structure of the book itself, this book is 96 pages in total and it is very short. And I think that when you have a very short book, it needs to be at least a lot more cohesive and organized to make up for the length of it. And I did not get that sense from this book. She has two sections throughout the book called me and you, but these sections are very arbitrary and honestly, they could be swapped out with each other and not have made any difference at all. Plus, she also jumps in between different timelines, so it doesn't feel like there's been any organization into how these essays were put together. So I think she should have either organized it chronologically or organized it based on subject matter. But because she didn't do either of those things, it feels like a very random series of essays that are just a bunch of thoughts strung along together, which makes me think, what is the point of having this be a book rather than a series of tweets or a series of Tumblr posts? That being said, it's still a very short and good book to read. And then the last book that I read is, I'm not sure if it's considered a book, but it's an interactive graphic novel called The Boat SBS. I'll just move over here so I can put it over here. So this is basically a graphic novel about a woman fleeing from Vietnam. I rated this five stars. So finally, we're ending the reader on, on a strong note. I think if I had read it in a traditional book with just text, I would have rated it three stars. The writing is very short and choppy. There's no context for the Vietnam War that it takes place in, so you don't really have much of a historical setting, and you don't really feel emotionally connected to the characters. Despite all of that, the reason why I rated it five stars is because I was just so blown away by the production quality of the whole thing. You can tell there were so many thoughtful decisions that were put into piecing this interactive novel together. It ranged from everything like the art direction, the sound design, the transitions and the animations of the comic panels, all of that had so much thought put into it that it made the story feel so much more immersive and visceral and the best thing about it is that it is totally free and open to the public to consume. So I'll put a link in the description if you are curious about it. But if you decide to read it, I recommend just finding like a place in your room that is quiet and just blasting the volume on loud. All of the music and the sound effects help make you feel kind of claustrophobic when you see the woman being on that boat with tons of other refugees. There are all these little animation decisions like having the comic panel swing back and forth across your computer screen when the boat starts rocking and even the emotional beats throughout the story were done really well for example there is a character that is basically starving throughout the story and as you scroll down the watercolor that is painting him is slowly evaporating from the screen so all of those little details make it so freaking good that i just had to rate it five stars only based on the technical talent alone. I totally get why anyone might rate this three stars if they don't have like the historical context of the Vietnam War. I think that if you are a designer or if you are an artist, you might be able to appreciate the interactive comic book more even just from a craft perspective. However, if you are Vietnamese, you might also appreciate it just as a sobering story for you to read and reflect on your ancestry. I have never really felt connected to my culture. A lot of what I associate with my culture, I associate with my family, which I have completely shut off from my life. After I read this comic book and I read the little facts that they had on the side, they were saying that most of the refugees that fled from Vietnam were coming between like, the 1970s to the 1990s. I was born in 1994 and I know that my parents came to America a couple of years before that. It really got me thinking, why did they come to America or what conditions were they in to flee 
to the US? Were they refugees in the first place? How did they even get here? I ended up texting my sister and asking her like, hey, were our parents refugees? Like, where did they come from? And why did they come here? And honestly, it wasn't as dramatic. They just took a plane to get here. I think my dad was a refugee and he ended up sponsoring my mom and sister and grandparents to eventually come here. So not as like, dramatic of a story as you might read from most fiction about Vietnamese culture, but it made me very curious about my family history. Not in the sense where I would want to connect to my family again, because I still don't, but more so in the sense where I wondered all of the things that they had to go through, you know, like poverty in Vietnam, because it is considered a second world country. It just made me wonder all the shit that they went through, because I do think that when you analyze it, it might inform who I am today, in the sense where, why am I so fucked up? Like, why am I depressed? Um, a lot of it might have to do with intergenerational trauma and various experiences that have been ingrained in our DNA and passed down from generation to generation. Just by having an inkling of my family history and what my ancestors have gone through, it better informs me about the person that I am today. I just got very reflective after the whole thing. Granted, I read this comic book when I was like alone in my apartment late at night. I think the whole thing just set up the mood for me. So those were all of the books I read for Asian Readathon. I do want to point out that I actually ended up reading a few non-Asian books throughout the month though. The first book that I read was actually rolled over from April, and then I had to finish this book before I started the readathon, and that was Her Body and Other Parties. This is a collection of short stories that incorporates magical realism, and each story centers upon women's lives and the violence that is inflicted upon their bodies, whether that's from other people, or from society, or even from themselves. So this book was very hard for me to rate, mostly because throughout reading it, I was like, what the fuck is going on? I ended up rating this four stars, because I do think that it's a really good book. I think that the writing is very atmospheric and nuanced. And honestly, I kind of feel like this is the level of nuance that The Handmaid's Tale should have been. Because with The Handmaid's Tale, I feel like the themes of it were so obvious, but this one actually made you think. After I read each short story, I would stop what I was doing, put down the book, and then look up online the short story to see what other people were saying or interpreting. I think that this is a good example of magical realism because the stuff that happens is so fucking strange, but they give you just enough to let you interpret the story for yourself and what it could mean and what the author was trying to convey. It's also a good example of how you can pull off short story collections very well. Each story was meant to show some kind of purpose or some portrayal of women's violence. I also appreciated how basically almost every story incorporated a female and female relationship, but it wasn't centered around that female-female relationship. It was just like, part of the story and part of a very normalized universe. The reason why I did not rate it five stars is because pretty much my same complaint with most short story collections, which is that the quality of the work is very uneven. So many stories are extremely vague where you don't know what the fuck the whole point is. And then there are some where, in my opinion, was too obvious. And then there are a few that are just right in the middle that hit that sweet spot of being vague enough for you to interpret on your own, but not so vague that you don't have to work for it. That's the kind of sweet spot that I like. But when there are stories that jump between being too vague or being too obvious, I think that creates a disconnect from the short story collection to be cohesive as a whole. To name a few stories that I'm talking about in case you are interested or in case you have read the book before, especially Heinous and Mothers, those two stories were way too vague and confusing for my taste. But then there is another story called Eight Bites, which was way too obvious. Obvious. And then the sweet spots for me were the husband stitch and difficult at parties. Oh, and another thing is that I believe that every concept that she wrote about in each story was very interesting, but I felt like they only remained as a concept, like as a thought starter, but they were never really finished into a complete 
thesis or a complete thought. Like I felt like there was too much left hanging and I wish she gave us a little bit more. It's kind of like if you were writing a big essay and you only submitted your thesis instead of the complete essay. That's what it felt like to me. And maybe this was on purpose, but I guess based on my personal preferences, I want a little bit more in order for me to feel like this was a cohesive story. I'm gonna read one quote from the book that I liked as a testament to just how nice her writing was and how thought-provoking her writing style is as well. What if you colonized your own mind and when you get inside, the furniture is attached to the ceiling? What if you step inside and when you touch the furniture, you realize it's all just cardboard cutouts and it all collapses beneath the pressure of your finger? What if you get inside and there's no furniture? What if you get inside and it's just you in there, sitting in a chair, rolling figs and eggs around in the basket of your lap, and humming a little tune? What if you get inside and there's nothing there, and then the door hatch closes and locks? What is worse, being locked outside of your own mind or being locked inside of it? What is worse, writing a trope or being one? Very thought-provoking. I enjoyed it. However, I wish it was a little bit more spelled out for me, but maybe that's just because I'm a dumb bitch. And speaking of dumb bitch, the other book that I read is X's and O's. And this is a book that I read because I was on a plane ride back to New York and I had finished Girls of Paper and Fire halfway through my trip and I had no other book to read. So I turned to the lady that was sitting next to me and I asked her if I could read her book instead. And she actually ended up giving me this book because that's how little she cared for it. And I can understand why. This is basically a chiclet that I don't even know how I can describe it. It's... The main character is a child psychiatrist and she ends up dating this guy, but then she finds out that one of her patients, who is this four-year-old kid, is the son of a mother who is the guy's ex-girlfriend. But it gets so much more complicated than that because so much weird, wacky shit happens in this book that I've decided to make a separate book review about it. This whole book is like a clusterfuck and I kind of just want to share how messy it was with the whole world. I'll go more in detail in that separate video review, but basically I gave this book 2.5 stars and I will explain why in that review. And lastly, I also read two picture books in the month of May because when I was in New York, I was at Jocelyn's bookstore and she was working in the children's section which had a collection of really cute picture books that Nikki and I were browsing. So the first book that really caught my eye and I just grabbed and decided to read was How to Make Friends with a Ghost. This was one of those books where I grabbed it because the artwork looked really cute and I thought all I was gonna do was just flip through it, but I actually ended up reading it from start to finish and honestly, it was a really cute book. I really liked the limited color palette of the artwork because I feel like it helped set up the tone of the story as being like this cutesy, spooky kind of book to read. But then there's pops of red that you will see become more important later towards the end of the book. The writing itself is really quirky. A lot of the tips that it gives is just really like offbeat and random and cute. Like for example, if you are inviting guests over to your house and you don't want them to be afraid of your ghost, you can pretend that your ghost is a tissue box and fold them like so, and just a few other weird tips like that. So basically, I thought that writing was very creative and thoughtful. I think that this is one of those things where you could totally have been lazy and just write whatever comes to your mind first, but the author actually clearly put some thought into it. And yeah, Artwork was cute, writing was cute. I don't really have anything bad to say about it. So I ended up rating it five stars. At first I wasn't sure if I should rate or review it. Picture books are obviously a different set of literature to read other than traditional books, but you know what? My rating on Goodreads is so low that I need to bump it up anyway. So yes, I'm gonna rate picture books from now on if I happen to read them. The next book that I read was Little P, which was a book that Nikki was trying to show to me because she really loves it. And I think she really only loves it because the faces on those peas are so fucking stupid in a funny way. We were basically just giggling at the faces of the peas as we were flipping through the book. But I rated this three stars because I think other than just the quirky faces, there were really wasn't much <laughs> to this story. How to Make Friends with a Ghost felt much more creative and thoughtfully put together. And then Little P was just there. So rated it three stars 
Honestly, it ain't that deep either way. This is why I find it very hard to rate picture books, but you know, here we are. I'm trying to bump it up, okay? All in all, those were all the books that I read in May. Hello, I wanted to pop in and conclude this video with my June TBR as well as some shout outs that I owe to the community. For my June TBR, I am participating in the Biblio Games, which is hosted by Mayana from Little Wolf Reads. I didn't participate in it last year, but this year it has really easy challenges that are accessible and that's really all I need to participate in a readathon. This year it is superhero themed. Well, I mean, it's sky high themed, which is basically superheroes and you can choose which team that you're on. I am on the villains team, even though personality-wise, I'm more of an anti-hero, but the prompts for villains was more aligned with what I've been meaning to read anyway. For the month of June, I actually started the month finishing up a literary novel called Severance by Ling Ma. This was basically a book from Asian Readathon that kind of rolled over to June, and I will be talking more about that in my June wrap-up. But for Biblio Games specifically, there was a prompt that said to read a book in a format that you don't typically read. So for that, I'm going to be reading Wa, The Essence of Japanese Design, because instead of a traditional novel, this is basically a visual story with a, a bunch of annotations and like contextual essays about Japanese design, but it is mostly pictures and I think that will help a lot with bumping up my page count for the Biblio games because otherwise I'm a very slow reader. The other prompt that I'm going to tackle is to read a book with a badass main character. So I'm going to be reading Defy the Face by Claudia Gray. This was given to me by Thomas Nguyen, so thank you so much for gifting this. This is the third book in the Defy the Stars trilogy and I am excited to read the conclusion of it because it is is a very underrated book series. It has a very healthy romantic relationship that I really enjoy and I am actually almost halfway through it because I started it on an airplane last month. I just haven't gotten to finish it. But it's a good thing that I waited a little bit before finishing it because that fulfills the prompt of a badass main character. There's another prompt that tells you to read a sci-fi book. So even though technically Defy the Fates fits into that category, I'm going to use The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders for that because I've been meaning to read it. And then the last challenge that I'm going to do for the Biblio games is to buddy read. And for that, I am going to be buddy reading Radio Silence with Debbie's Library. This is also the book that we are reading for Paper Cut Book Club, which is a live show hosted by me, Jordan Harvey, and Kat. Specifically, this book will be on a live show on Cast Channel. Those will be the books I'll be reading in June. However, if I have enough time to squeeze in a few other books for the month, I have been meaning to read some Harvard Business Review books, just more nonfiction in general, because I feel like I've been slipping up on that. And I also have been meaning to read If We Were Villains by M.O. Rio, as well as An Enchantment of Ravens. So we'll see how I feel, but the first few books that I mentioned will be a definite read for me. The second thing that I want to share is just some shout outs for a few small booktubers. I recently hit 30,000 subscribers. I don't know how the fuck that happened, but what I do every time I hit a thousand subscriber milestone is that I will shout out a small booktuber who has less than a thousand subscribers. This is a way for me to divert attention from myself because that makes me uncomfortable onto other people instead. Last time I did this, I had 28K and now I have 30K, which means that I owe two shout outs. And to go along with the whole theme of these books being for Asian Readathon, I will shout out Asian booktubers specifically. The first booktuber that I want to shout out is Sam from Cozy Afternoons. I really like how she has like these calm, relaxed vibes to her videos. She does a combination of reading and travel vlogs. And I think the most recent one that she did is for the Asian Readathon in New York City. So if you liked the vlog that I did for Asian Readathon in New York City, you should check out hers as well. Well. She also covers manga if you are into that, but if not, the rest of her videos are just as good. The next booktuber I want to shout out is Sophia from S. Yumi Yamamoto. She's not just restricted to books because she discusses a variety of stories ranging from movies to TV to even video games. She's also a writer and she does a few writing videos, so overall she just has a lot of variety to her channel. She does travel videos, she does unboxing, she does haul videos, she did this one video that listed her 10 
and favorite fantasy tropes. There's just a lot of material to consume in her channel. So if you are interested in just expanding booktube tastes and preferences and maybe even diversifying the type of people that you watch on booktube, definitely check out those two girls that I have mentioned. Other than that, don't forget to unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye. So don't you tell me that I'm just overthinking I've always been a pretty slow one to learn You know it's hard to face the truth